All right, I will go ahead and get us started. Welcome. I believe you should all be here for the presentation on Because We Needed to Talk, Connecting to Engage Our Students Across Disciplines and Institutions. Thank you so much for joining us on a gray, typical Ohio May day. I must say I'm a bit jealous as I heard that this was the end of OSU's finals week and I am in the thick of grading as is uh, my colleague here, Dr. Fatim. So um, yeah, I'm jealous that some of you are already finished, but I'm um, thankful that we can take the opportunity to take a moment and kind of reflect on our experience. And we're excited to share with you our experience um, and connect with you today. So um, just wanted to go over a couple of things before, um, before we introduce ourselves. So uh, uh, if you would like to turn on your camera, that would be awesome, but you don't need to. You are all um, automatically muted. If you want, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and type that in the chat um, and someone will be able to unmute you. Um, we'll have some opportunities for breakout sessions throughout the um, the event, and I believe we are together until around 12:25. So um, that's kind of kind of the plan for today. All right. So um, just a couple of uh, that we think you will get out of this session um, by the end of the next hour or so. We hope that you'll be able to identify some ideas for taking learning outside of the classroom, um, gain some practical tips for developing, facilitating, marketing, coordinating a virtual speaker series. And most importantly, we hope that you'll have an opportunity to um, brainstorm ideas with individuals from other institutions. And uh, to get the most out of this session, we really hope that uh, you make sure that you do not leave without um, some practical tips as well as uh, without making some connections to uh, folks who are joining us um, as we talk about some ideas for um, taking that learning outside of the classroom. So who are we? Uh, my name is Angel Stahlhunter. I am a, an associate professor of sociology at Ohio Dominican University. I've been teaching for 11 years now um, in a lot of different courses at a small arts institution. And I've been working over the past two years um, with uh, Dr. Irene Patin. I'll let her introduce herself. Yeah, I'm uh, Irene Patine, and I teach over at Columbus State Community College. I'm in the Social Sciences Department, uh, an associate professor there, and I'm also the co-director of the Honors Program. Um, and I was very, very pleased to get to meet Angel um, through an OER project. And so we first made our connection there. And um, Angel was awesome uh, and reached out and actually took the, you know, took the lead in making contact. And so it's kind of what we're hoping that everybody gets to do here is like, be, be like Angel <laughs> and make contact with each other. Make sure that you don't leave this session without actually um, getting somebody's contact details and, you know, going that extra mile and reaching out outside of the session. Awesome. So we would like to um, get to know a little bit about you. So what do you do? And then what are you looking forward to the most this summer? So maybe that's some extra sleep, some good reading, a trip, uh, warm weather, your kids home from school. If you're looking forward to that, please tell me why, how you make that happen. Um, you could just type your answers in the chat. We'll keep on adding to the chat. I know that we can multitask um, and listen and type at the same time. So please feel free. Um, and so I just kind of want to give a little bit of background. So we decided to, you know, get together and, and work on um, and work on a, a speaker series with each other in the middle of the, in the midst of the pandemic. And, you know, this is a time where we're all burned out and stressed. <laughs> and I just wanted to say, you know, this is wasn't actually just more work. I'll use a line that I use in honors. It's not more work, it was different work. Um, and at a time, you know, where students really needed inspiration and motivation, I mean, they need this anyway to effectively learn. Um, during the pandemic, that became even more important, right? Because in many ways, um, pandemic style of education made learning a really mechanical process, um, which is really not learning at all. And we wanted to um, get out of that mode 
and help to provide an alternative. And just like you know, motivation is vital to student learning, it's really also vital for professors too, so that we can be passionate about what we do, and so that we can actually you know help communicate and get that passion contagious with our students. And we're lifelong learners as well, um, so it was really important for us to recapture that for ourselves. Um, and we're trying to you know just change the learning landscape um, that was around and try to help ourselves get through a very difficult time. Um, and importantly, you know, we know that engagement is really key uh, to learning and student success. Um, so, you know, students are more successful, obviously, when they're actually more engaged. Um, and there's a lot of multiple overlapping ways in which students can actually be engaged. Um, and the more engaged they are, the better it is for them, for their learning and for their success. And so um, to be engaged, you know, students have to have an attachment, integration to the people, places, um, and uh, ideas. So they should be working with each other. They should be working with professors. Um, they should be working towards uh, a common goal. They should be part of clubs, using college facilities and resources, potentially working and interning on campus. Um, and then also feel like they have a sense of belonging and place. So have an affiliation with the values that are being um, espoused at the college, the rules that are in place, um, and feel a connection <clears throat> in a supportive and helpful environment. And this helps students um, be engaged. And if you take a look, um, also the quality of what they're doing also matters, right? Uh, so it shouldn't just be busy work things to get, keep students occupied, but it should be um, meaningful and purposeful um, activity. And it should be something that's engrossing and keeping their attention. All this is really vital to true engagement in the learning process where they get to take ownership of what they're doing um, and, uh, and get something out of the experience. And all of that helps students um, feel more attached, uh, feel more of a sense of belonging and be more likely to learn. Um, so if we look at, you know, this is all from the, the Nessie survey, I'm sure they're all very familiar with, and there's a lot of criticism to it, but, you know, as sociologists, we really kind of strongly um, uh, hold to the uh, Durkheimian components <laughs> to, uh, to the Nessie survey. And if you look at all the areas that they use as um, key indicators of engagement, during the pandemic, a lot of these were really seriously impacted. Obviously, the campus culture completely changes. The experiences with faculty completely changes. We had students who, you know, were either unwilling or unable to actually put video on to be able to even see um, their professors. And so that, that kind of attachment and integration really disintegrated um, quite a bit. Uh, so mm -hmm. the students were also struggling um, in a lot of other ways. Uh, in my institution, we have a large proportion of students who are considered at risk even before the pandemic. And then the pandemic, um, with its lack of social contact um, and increased stress, really just kind of eliminated any feelings of control over the situation. So having an internal locus of control where you feel like you can control events and have some kind of influence on what happens um, is really a vital human need. And so the pandemic really demolished that for a lot, of, a lot of students. And this furthermore affected students' coping mechanisms. And so in order to be able to cope in a situation, you have to um, have that situation be perceived as manageable. Pandemic was certainly uh, not manageable for many of us. And so, you know, the engages that you're engaging in coping also have to seem meaningful and have to be comprehensible or understandable to you. And so the pandemic learning environment did not uh, <laughs> help with this at all. Um, and so, you know, students are not learning as effectively, not feeling engaged. And then also they have um, these, ex these severe stressful situations that are kind of ebbing away at their typical and traditional uh, coping mechanisms. And so really we were, you know, coming together to complain and to commiserate with what was going on. And we just wanted to try to figure out like, how do we take back control, right? And how do we actually engage students in a meaningful way but is also motivational to them and to us. Um, so um, in uh, actually the summer of 2020, right after we were coming out of quarantine, um, I had an idea. 
And part of this idea was kind of spurred by just being frustrated with our typical kind of admissions events. I'm a sociology professor and I go to admissions events and no one ever wants to be a sociology major. And I feel like a used car salesman trying to tell them how awesome sociology is, which was so frustrating for me because I know how awesome sociology is, but I am also not a used car salesman. So I wanted to think about a way that we could actually excite students about a discipline that is meaningful and timely and relevant, but do it in a way that felt authentic and in a way that allowed us to kind of really highlight the ways that our discipline was provided some tools, some answers, even questions to understanding kind of the craziness that was going on around us. And so out of this context, as Irene was talking about, of just a perceived lack of control in so many areas of our life, including kind of the higher ed landscape, which was a hot mess um, in summer of 2020, uh, I thought, is there a way that we could connect um, with our students in a more meaningful way and with each other in a meaningful way? So as I mentioned, or as I mentioned, we had already worked together on a project, um, on an OER project, and had enjoyed that collaboration. So I sent an email and said, hey, I have a crazy idea. What if we did some kind of speaker series where we had our colleagues kind of highlight how the social and behavioral sciences could contribute to understanding some of the things that were going on in our society. So this was the summer of George Floyd, um, lots of protests going on. There was a lot of just things that we felt we could, we could talk about. So we had a Zoom meeting like this and we brainstormed some ideas of current events that might be interesting to talk about. Um, we kind of came up with a title for our speaker series. Um, this was all Irene. And if you ever need any type of marketing, she is phenomenal with creative um, titles, blurbs, et cetera. Um, and we, we kind of drafted this idea in about an afternoon, having no idea um, how many people would come, if this would be well received. Uh, and I sent a call out to my colleagues in the division and said, hey, we have this idea. Does anybody want to be our first presenter? And uh, right away, uh, Dr. Matthews emailed back and said, actually, I have a talk related to some research I've been working on that I think would be really undergraduate friendly. I'd be willing to go first in your series. Um, and so she stepped up and we started promoting um, this uh, speaker series. And the first session was phenomenal. We had, I uh, believe, about 30 people attend, students from Ohio Dominican and from Columbus State. Um, her presentation, Dr. Matthews' presentation, was about 20 minutes long. It was very engaging. And what shocked us was for the next 40 minutes, we had students asking questions in the chat. And this was not something that we had experienced in our typical Zoom intro to sociology courses. And so we felt like, wow, we had really hit a nerve. This was something that students wanted, that they wanted to participate in. And we were just so jazzed after that first session. So we went ahead and planned out a series of talks relating to current events over the next several semesters. And we've actually continued this into the spring. Um, and we, play, we did about four um, sessions per semester. They were each an hour uh, between five and six uh, uh, over Zoom. And what we found was most of the sessions, we had students sticking around after six o'clock. We actually had to cut it off and say, hey, we need to go eat dinner um, because they were asking questions. These were topics that resonated with the students. So it turned out to be such a uh, rewarding event um, for us to see our students actually get engaged. So these are some of the uh, sessions that we were able to have over the past two years. Um, we looked at issues related to race and criminal justice system. We looked at stress and self-care during the pandemic, um, making decisions in a world of risk, um, health, uh, homelessness, topics that were in the news, um, topics that our colleagues had expertise in. 
And um, the, set, the series kind of morphed a little bit over, over the semesters where we went from more of a just one presenter to we paired a presenter from Ohio Dominican, a presenter from Columbus State to tackle a topic. Uh, this past uh, year, we moved away from just a straight presentation to more of a Q&A panel style. And we actually involved our students as facilitators in that panel, um, which was really exciting to see them practice some of their presentation skills, as well as get excited about, you know, feeling like experts on a particular topic. Um, and so we will likely continue with that kind of student facilitated Q&A panel um, moving forward. So part of what we wanted to share with you today is not just, hey, we did this thing and it worked, but um, some reflection around what were some aspects that we really felt were um, uh, pieces that we did that, that helped this to work well, um, and some things that we learned through, through doing this speaker series and connecting across institutions. So I wanna start with some kind of big picture tips uh, and then we'll move into more of the kind of nuts and bolts around kind of um, things that you might want to consider uh, as you're, as you're uh, doing your own activity. Uh, but before we do that, um, we wanted to take a moment and put you in breakout rooms to do a little bit of brainstorming on your own. So before we get into the practical kind of how to do this, uh, just thinking about what students need now, because our students in 2020 are different from our students in 2022. Some of the challenges around mental health have remained, um, but there are some new challenges. We're considering, you know, how much do we do on Zoom? How much do we do? What do our students need now? And you're all coming fresh out of um, a year of teaching and learning and working with students. So what do you think? I'm curious to hear what your experiences have been. So we'll go ahead and have Richard uh, put you in breakout rooms with about um, four or five people in each of those rooms. And I'd mm -hmm. like you to discuss what your students need, but also um, what does it look like to meet those needs now? And maybe a speaker series is not what it looks like, but what are some ideas that you have um, for both what the needs are and then ways that you you might consider meeting those needs. So five minutes to talk with each other and we'll come back together as a group and we will um, share what we've talked about in those breakout sessions. I thought uh, if we could take a minute, if you want to share and would like to be unmuted, if you could just um, raise your hand or type that in the chat, that would be fabulous. Um, and I believe Richard can unmute you or can help unmute. Uh, or you can just type in the chat so maybe one or two of the key takeaways from your breakout session. I was in group two and um, I don't work on campus. So my job's a little different, but those that do were sharing that they're seeing much more anxiety, depression, mental health issues. It used to be diabetes and those kinds of things that they saw that students needed help with. And um, another person said, they're, they, the students are needing support and need to know that people care. So I'm a county extension educator, and that's what I find to be very true for the adults in the community that I work in, mm -hmm. too. So that's very interesting to me that it's so similar for adults as to what the students are needing its impact. It really says it's impacting everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we went before the pandemics being frustrated with being in traffic and being, you know, feeling harried to have to go to another meeting on campus from one place to the next to not having any contact with anybody at all. And that really just, um, you know, pierced a hole into our social fabric and, and tore us apart in ways that we're still trying to make sense of. So, yeah, it's absolutely all of us. They also mentioned that there are resources on campus, but sometimes they're needing to connect uh, students to resources off campus. Mm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of new resources um, that weren't available prior to the pandemic that are now. And I think that's a really good point um, that we all have to become more aware so we can actually figure out where um, to direct people when they have, when they have problems, questions and need support. Thanks for sharing, Pat. That was helpful. 
other folks' um, takeaways. I see one in the chat from Eva, the importance of these types of events to allow faculty and staff to connect with each other is vital. Um, great to share ideas and what others are doing. Uh, one group talked about check-ins with students on a personal level, especially at the beginning of every class. Absolutely. And that connects to some of what Pat was saying with the increased anxiety and depression. How are we really accounting for that in our classes, connecting with students? And then do we know about the resources to connect to them with outside of campus? Great. Anybody else want to share? In uh, group four, we were talking a little, we were talking about um, how to connect students with outside companies or professionals in their field and how now it's actually more challenging because um, being able to turn your camera off and sort of disconnect has sort of atrophied some of those social skills needed to act to effectively network. And so um, we talked about how to create facilitated networking opportunities where you sort of give students exposure to professionals in their fields and help them make connections. And then not just like put them in front of, you know, potential hiring people to do a final presentation without any sort of previous exposure. So how to like get them back into being, you know, social and professional. Absolutely. I mean, that is so, so vital. And, you know, we've all been very attuned at different times during the pandemic of like how tone, um, is really just problematic when you're just relying solely on, you know, written communication um, or you're seeing somebody for a brief moment, you know, in a Zoom chat and you can't quite tell what their surroundings are and what's distracting them. Is it you, you know, <laughs> um, or is it something else that's bothering them? And so, you know, those have been problematic for all of us. And then keeping in mind that, you know, some people haven't even had that kind of interaction and trying to figure out how to be um, and, while they're trying to become professionals. I mean, that's part of their role in, in higher ed. Uh, is this what they're trying to learn to do? So yeah, these are, you know, be able to have that kind of step-by-step, -step, hey, let's learn how um, to interact on this professional basis is extremely important. Great point. Yeah. I'm relearning the names of people. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so used to seeing screens. Yeah, I'm a person, I have, such a hard time with with names and proper nouns generally, to be honest with you. Uh, if I'm tired or stressed, all of those words go out of the window for me. Um, and so people's names, in particular, getting back in the in that mindset of, yes, I do have to actually address people by their name because I do want them to know that I want to be with them <laughs> and hear from them. It's so hard. So these are great points. Thank you. So we will, um, I think we're going to kind of step back into the formal um, formal presentation mode, but we're going to have a lot of interaction throughout. So we're just going to share a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Angel so she can share some of the some of the tips <laughs> that we have for, for implementation that worked for us. Absolutely. And please feel free to continue to type in the chat. Um, I liked um, that facilitated networking as one kind of potential idea already for ways that we can meet those needs. Um, and maybe that's being more intentional in, in setting up events for students. Um, really appreciate that. So some overall kind of big picture tips, things that we found were really helpful in setting up the speaker series that I think would apply to whatever kind of event or activity you're thinking of to create that connection. So facilitate so uh, networking, et cetera. One big tip that we uh, found was to start with what you know. We knew uh, sociology and we wanted to start with ways that sociology could help us make sense of and understand the world around us. Um, we also found that it was really important to start small. Uh, we were tired and we were busy and we were converting our courses to online courses and uh, Finding a colleague who already had a presentation that was ready to go, we said, okay, great, we'll start there and we'll see how it goes. Um, we didn't have a big expectation for what this speaker spirit series would turn into. We just knew that we wanted to do something, we wanted to start something. So starting with what we knew and starting small was really helpful. Um, another piece that was particularly relevant to 
our speaker series was finding topics that were timely. Um, so the sessions that did uh, the best were the sessions that really related to what the students were um, dealing with, were thinking about kind of in that moment. So our two sessions on inequality in the criminal justice system um, were phenomenally attended. I think we had over 100 reg uh, people register and something like 80 um, folks come out to those sessions because people had questions. They had questions about what was going on. They had questions about how to think about it, how to do better in the way that they interacted. Um, what could they do to make a change in the criminal justice system? So that was something that we found really important. And what we were really careful of was that as we were dealing with those timely topics, we didn't extend our area of expertise. We kind of brought it back to at a very basic, these were undergrad students, right? So things that they were learning about in the classroom, the theories, the concepts, and applying that to those timely topics. Uh, I know that Irene and I were on a panel looking at uh, QAnon, and that was neither of our areas of expertise, but we both teach deviance. And so we, we said, hey, here's some topics you've been learning about in class. Here's a really relevant um, issue. How can we take and apply some of these basic theories to using those as a lens to understand this issue that's going on right now. And finally, um, something that was really important to us was leveraging that social capital. And the speaker series actually um, helped us to build some social capital with our colleagues um, by inviting them to previous um, presentations, by kind of introducing across institutions. I know our ed department came to our presentation on how the pandemic was influencing education. And we had a child development expert there talking about um, child development. And so we were able to make some of those connections, but we started with people that were down the hall that we could say, hey, I need you to do me a favor. We're doing this speaker series. Can you come talk for us? And we were amazed with how quickly our colleagues really stepped up to the task and said, yeah, absolutely, we will do that. We think this is a great idea. Um, so leveraging kind of that social capital wherever you have it um, and starting from there rather than just reaching out to folks you wouldn't already have established those kind of norms, reciprocity, and trust. So <laughs> we had um, we had a lot that worked that we were really happy with um, on this uh, this series. Uh, really, our colleagues, as Angel said, were really eager uh, to take part, and part of that was um, just making it making the barrier for contributing um, pretty low. Uh, I would ask my colleagues, you know, what are you doing in your class right now? That's actually uh, that you like or that you've changed in light of the pandemic that you can you can share with other people, you know, what's something that you've added that you're proud of and you'd like to share? And uh, what are you thinking about? You know, one of the, um, the session on QAnon, I've got a colleague that is interested in, in very deviant um, subgroups and political extremism, and she just keeps tabs on it. And she said, oh yeah, I've been really, I would be really eager to share this with other people. I've been really interested in trying to, to find a group that I can talk this out with so I can have a little bit of um, feedback and be able to construct a, a reasonable presentation. And so, you know, working with what people have already done, knowing that, you know, this is not an intimidating environment is really useful. It's been really great to make um, connections with people over at ODU. Um, because as a community college professor, we're often, you know, the, the last people picked in the gym class, you know, <laughs> people don't necessarily want to want to interact with us. And so it's been really, uh, it's been really nice for my colleagues as well as myself to be able to interact with the professors over at ODU and kind of share, uh, share what they're doing. So the um, way that uh, that everybody's been welcoming has helped a lot. And it's not like giving a presentation at a conference where you're working on research that you've been doing for, you know, two or three years. And this is the culmination of that research. Um, so it was really nice <laughs> to be able to just say, hey, I've got an idea. Let's just play with that. Um, it's like something I would present to my students, but hey, let's kind of present it to a wider audience. Um, and, and being more, um, seeing other people do that made other made others more likely to take part as well. And we really just did um, barely in time marketing and that actually worked really well. So we sent out notifications about a week before 
these talks and said, hey, you know, show up to this talk. It's going to be on Zoom. And I had a lot of feedback from colleagues and students who said, hey, um, you know, I, I would see them as, oh, thanks for attending. I saw you there. That was a great comment. Um, they said, oh, well, you made it really easy to show up. <laughs> we would just send a bunch of emails, um, you know, to students, uh, you know, for that week. They just got drilled for that week, not a whole month or two months in advance. Uh, so that was very helpful. And like Angel said, the topics that we had were very relevant to what students were experiencing, what our colleagues were experiencing at the time. Um, making sure the presentations were not long uh, was also very helpful because you could actually see, we encourage people to, you know, keep their cameras, um, keep their cameras on just like you are. So we can get a sense of, you know, our audience and get, make that connection. And we could see when the presentations were too long, everybody started to glaze a little bit. So even within that hour long slot, if somebody went a little bit over the amount of time that was um, preferred, <laughs> it made a difference. Um, and having Q&A and encouraging that, making that one of the most uh, important features, I think, of this talk and making it okay to ask um, what might otherwise be seen as a stupid question um, in a welcoming environment with people who are actually, you know, monitoring the chat. We had colleagues monitoring the chat and responding when a speaker was, was talking. Uh, so that was actually um, really helpful. And that was something that happened a little bit organically. Uh, where we just happened to have someone who was interested in watching the topic because they were also working on something similar. And so um, they were able to answer student questions because it was very much set up as a forum for students to ask questions and get answers. So if the presentations were too long. That was not so good. There was a couple of people who didn't, um, didn't keep to time <laughs> exactly. And that wasn't so great. Uh, some of the pairings were excellent where we had a practical component um, from, say, somebody who was a parole officer and then someone who had a JD uh, speaking more kind of theoretically and looking at the, at, at the law um, and implications of precedent. And that worked great. In other situations, the pairings were a little bit more awkward and they sounded good on paper and they didn't exactly match up as much as we would like. But that's to be expected. Um, but if we didn't have people buying in, you know, colleagues who are just willing to, to make this work, it wouldn't have worked at all. And we're really still kind of faced with the, with the question of, you know, will we actually continue to use Zoom? I don't know. Um, we haven't figured that out yet because we, on the one hand, we do have people saying things like, hey, you made it really easy to attend, which we know is, is Zoom. And we had some students uh, who are attending working in a kitchen um, and just having their, putting their phone to the side, we could see them kind of, you know, doing dishes and all kinds of things uh, in the kitchen at work, um, taking part. So that obviously did make it very easy for them to attend. They probably wouldn't be able to attend in person. So we have to figure um, that out. So, uh, Angel, <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to you again. I'm going to uh, set up this Padlet. Fabulous. So it looks like we have um, about uh, 15 minutes left and we wanted to spend the bulk of our time now giving you an opportunity to connect with each other. So to get us started, we have a short Padlet um, with three questions. If you could all um, type your responses to the questions in the Padlet and you should uh, be able to click on, we'll put the link in the chat and you'll be able to click on the link and then there it is. Uh, and then uh, type in your answers. You'll be able to see each other's answers and get some ideas. And then we're going to go back into the breakout rooms uh, for about five to seven minutes. And you have an opportunity to meet with some of your colleagues and maybe brainstorm further some things that you could do. So maybe a speaker series is not the best um, route for you, but what are some other ways that you could connect with your students, with your colleagues? Um, who are some people that you'd like to connect with across institutions, within any institutions that you're working? And then what are some kind of current topics that you'd like to um, talk about? So give me a minute to fill out the Padlet. And kind of around 12, 14, 12, 15, Richard will go ahead and put you all back into some breakout rooms and you can chat about um, some of the things that you were able to um, right on the Padlet. Hello, welcome back. 
we were just kind of scratching the surface in our group of some of these ideas. I feel like we could have been in a breakout session the rest of the afternoon. So I hope that you met someone um, who does something similar or is working on a project that you could partner up with. Does anyone want to share maybe one of their takeaways or a person that they met that they would um, think they could connect with? Well, I think the highlight in our group was that Nicole introduced us to a new term she's learned from students, which is body doubling, which is when students get together to do their online classwork in the same physical space to reinforce each other's motivation and stuff, which I'd heard of the practice, but I love that name for it. Yeah. <laughs> body doubling. Mm -hmm. I've not heard of that either. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks to my students. <laughs> Now, we had seen it in practice in uh, some of the audience members, you know, who, to the Zoom, but we, I had not heard the term. Any other takeaways that folks are willing to share? The other one was uh, lurking on Reddit and other online back channels that students use to get a sense of what's going on that they won't necessarily speak. Uh, when in formal settings. We talked about the importance of listening, that everybody wants to be, to know that people are actually listening to them. Absolutely. That, um, those two comments kind of tie in. What are some ways that people are not comfortable talking, maybe feel heard in some of these back channels? Yeah, and that I think is a real challenge for us as we're moving away from, you know, the restrictions of the pandemic, but still everybody feeling very much traumatized by everything that we've been through. You know, how do we actually take the good things that we've learned and the kinds of connections and the abilities to, to reach each other? Like, you know, like we are now, we can all be in different locations and still connect with one another um, and leave the bad stuff. <laughs> How do we re? How do we reimagine what we were doing before, um, and articulate it in a way that makes sense for now? So I think um, just being able to reach out and find what other people are doing at other institutions is actually really helpful for that. Um, I can't say enough about that for um, from my perspective and being able to work with Ohio Dominican and you know work with Angel and just see the way that people are doing things at other places um, has been helpful in allowing me to meet students a bit more where they are uh, to make those connections for sure. So I think we're all in for a, um, a challenging time, but hopefully it'll be invigorating as well. Okay. I think we are out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Um, please feel free to email us. We would love to connect with you as well. Um, and hopefully you've been a little bit inspired by what a collaboration um, can bring about and gotten some ideas for how you might reach out and partner, connect with folks around you. Thank you. Thank you so much.